own uh, a dozen Glocks. Most of them are model 20s and 10 millimeters because I rotate them because I, I wear them out. <laughs> I shoot so much. And uh, also some model 29s, the smaller Glock 10 millimeter. And I also have a Glock 40, I have the 26 and the 27 and 9 millimeter. It's a, they're all great guns. And the fact that law enforcement has chosen them uh, as their carry gun for so many years and in such numbers is a great testimony that it's a great, great firearm. With apologies to Mrs. Robinson, it turns out the future really is in plastics, at least when it comes to handgun design. In the early 1980s, Gaston Glock, who knew nothing about firearms, but was an expert in advanced synthetic polymers, assembled a group of experts to help him create the ideal military handgun. The result of that meeting was ultimately the Glock, which virtually overnight became the single best-selling pistol in history. The funny thing about Glock is it's become a, a, a universal term, a generic term. On the evening news, when you see a gun flash up for whatever reason, it's, it's usually a Glock now. Uh, but Gaston Glock wasn't a gun guy. I mean, he was a, a manufacturer. He dealt in plastics. He made things out of moist goo. That's what he did. Furniture, parts, whatever. Makes a hell of an entrenching tool, by the way. Well, Gaston Glock wasn't a pistol designer. He, 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 was, he, he knew a lot about polymers, uh, the synthetic polymer. So uh, he, he wasn't bound by the rules that everyone else is bound by. And so he broke all the rules. I'll tell you, I spent, thir I spent 35 years as an entrepreneur, and, and somebody, that, somebody that, that builds stuff and employs people and creates jobs and makes the economy go is my kind of hero. John M. Browning and Henry Ford, Trump, and Gaston Glock. Gaston Glock, who designed it as some sort of a mechanical genius, uh, he took a lot of uh, designs that existed and he fixed all of the problems with those guns and, you know, put them in this gun and made it something. The thing that brought Gaston Glock into the firearms business was a 1980 Austrian military contract. And he, he thought that, well, you know, my technology, I think I could do that. And he really was a leader in polymer technology. And, and not just polymer technology, people have been making stuff out of plastic for a long time, but it's, it's figuring out how to put the plastic and the metal together and having them stay together. Uh, and so he talked to some other manufacturers, other manufacturers approached him. Uh, obviously, a uh, military pistol contract, 17,000 units, that's, that's worth going after. What is a gun? It's an elegant solution to a very basic engineering and physics problem. You know, you've got, uh, you've got to contain so much volatile pressure for a certain am amount of time. You've got to be able to manufacture it. You've got to be able to train people to use it. It's got to be reliable. It's got to be reasonably lightweight. There's a whole uh, litany of attributes that it has to have to actually be a potential gun. And basically, after talking to other people, as a matter of fact, Gaston Glock was thrown out of the offices of another German gunmaker who just thought they would, you know, we don't want anything to do with this. It's an abomination. If your plant's dedicated to forging something and machining it out and then hand polishing it, that's what you do. Anybody that comes up with the idea of a polymer frame pistol into an operation like that's going to be laughed out. So it's got to be somebody from the outside that comes in with an idea that Sure, it's a new idea. It would never fly with an established company, but guess what? It can fly with a new company that has nothing to lose and everything to gain. Gun people tend to be locked into, much of the time, what's gone before. And uh, this, this man came out of the woodwork with uh, advanced polymer, uh, inexpensive uh, machining and, and uh, production methods. He eventually decided to go after it himself. and. For a guy who didn't know anything about guns, he came up with a pretty good gun. It goes to show that if you don't have any preconceived notions of what you're going to build, and you're a really smart designer, and you understand the product you're working with, that's pretty amazing. I mean, it, it took the world up, it knocked the, the firearms world on its ear, boy, that, that thing was something. Everyone knew that three things were certain to fail in the American arms marketplace. 
plastic parts, a European background, and semi-auto pistols in general. That was especially true in law enforcement, where blue steel, wood grips, and an American revolver ruled. Glock wasn't the first polymer-framed pistol. That was the H&K VP70. Nor the first semi-automatic pistol for law enforcement. That was the Smith & Wesson Model 39. But Glock was the first to gain widespread acceptance on both counts. Here's a look at why. You know, I love the look of many guns, of most guns. I hate the look of the Glock because it's so dull. It's so uninteresting. There used to be a subsidiary Disney cartoon character. He was Donald Duck's uncle, and he was Uncle Scrooge. There was a scourge in Uncle Scrooge's life, and the scourge was the Beagle Boys. When they drew the guns that the Beagle Boys carried in the early 50s, I swear, they were Glock 17s. <laughs> the first Glock I saw belonged to a buddy of mine who was a state narcotics agent named Dave Englehart, and uh, he got one and uh, thought it was wonderful. I thought it was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever seen in my life. We went through a hostage negotiation seminar together, a tactical hostage thing the FBI put on, and he carried that gun and cleaned the course with it. I mean, it was really an amazing gun. I think he had the first one in the state of Iowa. When the Glocks first came out, I'll be the first to tell you, I was not terribly enamored with the gun. I remember I got one of the real early ones, still have it. I remember opening up the box and going, oh my God, Americans will never buy this. They want blue steel and walnut. They'll never buy this gun. Who says that cars got to be sexy? It's got to get you from here to there. I think Glock would tell you that, no, this gun isn't made to be sexy. It's a tool. And it's just about the most effective tool ever made for its purpose. Conventional shooters, guys who like blue steel and walnut, would, would make fun of Glocks as Tupperware guns. You know, they're dishwasher safe, you know, don't put them in the microwave, that sort of thing. And the funny thing about Glock is one of the, the, the early pistol boxes, literally, you ripped it open like a Tupperware container. So a friend of mine threw his box away, he just didn't want it. So I took it, I ground the lug out of it, and I, I used it as my lunchbox. I kept sandwiches in it. It was perfect. My granddaughter works for Glock. She shoots for Glock. And, but I've had a Glock for years. But I read articles and tests for probably a year or two before I could bring myself to buy a plastic gun. I don't know how he conceived of that safe action firing system in the gun. Um, it's almost something that somebody from some other uh, entity having to do with mechanical engineering uh, would have come up with. The recoil is being absorbed by the frame, by its flexing. The frame definitely flexes when it's fired. And when the slide comes back and stops, the frame does its thing, which is absorbing energy. If you have to name one thing, it's the guns run. They're reliable. And Having a pistol that runs is probably the best benefit that anybody could have because, you know, you want it. When you pull the trigger, you want it to go bang. Once you master the trigger, uh, it, it's very easy to manipulate the trigger well. It's, it's a gun that's, that, that you can shoot very well. It's the choice of a lot of professionals. The 1911 started out with a 45 and then scaled down to handle everything down to 9mm. Glock went the other way. They started with a 9mm and with a high capacity and then diminished capacity as they went up in, in uh, power factor. I'm not an engineer, but I know that you can take a 9mm gun and you can put a 40 caliber magazine in it. And I know the difference between 30, 30,000 PSI and 39,000 PSI. So you have to make all the other appropriate changes to allow for, for, for that. And, uh, and, and I think they've done that very well. The first Glock, the G17, was chambered for the 9mm NATO cartridge. But the American market quickly pushed Glock to expand the line. First to 40 Smith & Wesson, the most common American law enforcement caliber, 
Then the American classic, 45 ACP. Coming up, Glock becomes the standard. Amazingly, and before American companies were completely sure what was happening, Glock became the number one law enforcement handgun, and the day of the police 38 revolver came to a decisive close. But the civilian handgun market embraced the Glock just as enthusiastically. There was horrible misconceptions about it. I mean, it was, you know, the first one of the first guns on the market with a polymer frame. Uh, everybody said it was something that could go through metal detectors in airports. All of a sudden, people were in a frenzy about whether it was safe to fly anymore. Uh, but that slide in the barrel, I mean, <laughs> common sense, you know, you, you don't have a, anything but a steel barrel and a gun to get it to, to actually work more than once. <laughs> it was a time that was right for that gun. You had Carl Walther as their first marketing guy, and he's the guy who, who set the standard. He's the guy that was in on that Glock perfection and, and, and setting Glock apart. And American law enforcement started buying a lot of Glocks. What does a law enforcement community want? Well, you think about training for a minute. How do you train a bunch of cops? It's an excruciating thing to train a bunch of people. Try to train them on a 1911A1, keep them from shooting their foot, okay? Oh my gosh, now give me a safe pistol, an easy pistol to train people with. In the military, we can train a GI on a 92 because we've got them for a whole bunch of time. But a cop needs to be out on the street, and you don't have as much time to train a cop how to use a gun as the GIs get when they're in training. So the Glock pistol is an easier pistol to train with. They raised the bar in terms of expectations, in terms of reliability and functionality. Prior to that, we were willing to live. We had, we had malfunction drills as part of it, because if you wanted a really reliable gun, everybody knew you carried a six-shot revolver because you could pull the trigger again. Glock changed that with its, with its pistol. So you have to take these guys, and you have to train them how to use this pistol properly. When you only have one trigger pull, to master and no safeties to master, it makes the law enforcement trainer's job much easier. It's more simple. I mean, there is no thumb safety to take off. There's nothing to do. There's no manual of arms. Pull it out, point it, press the trigger when you're on target. It's brutally simple and brutally reliable. It's probably the gun I use the most now. In my training business and whatever I do, I use a Glock more than anything else. The reason's simple. It's a Glock world. Make no mistake, anywhere you go on this planet, you're going to counter a Glock. You have a price advantage, and you have all these features and benefits that are good for the market. What is going to happen? And if you're smart like Glock was, you'll spend a lot of money on promotion. If I were running for president of the United States, I would want the marketing guys out of the Glock operation back then to run my political campaign, because they did it masterfully. In many ways, the Glock is the first of what we might think of as the modern pistol. Machine rather than hand-fitted. Easy to manufacture and amazingly reliable. With law enforcement and much of the civilian market in its pocket, Glock began releasing new models, filling every available niche. The most recent, the so-called Generation 4s, introduced a dual recoil spring system that made an already light recoiling gun even easier to shoot. With Glock, the marketing campaign uh, that they undertook, the, uh, the way they, uh, they sell their product has, uh, again, changed the, 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 the rules of the game. Uh, you know, they came out with a gun that changed the rules of the game as far as its design and its... Uh, uh, f functioning, uh, its reliability, uh, with their marketing and their sales program, that also was revolutionary. It really has changed. Uh, Nine millimeter model, so whether you're shooting a subcompact, a compact, or full size, that grip feels the same. It's just a matter of how long that grip is underneath you. If you buy this Gen 4 Glock, the, the, the extra grips don't make it smaller, they make it bigger. And it's no, it's this, the, the frame is the standard SF, small frame that they came out with a few uh, years ago. 
If I really love a Glock, I'll send it away and have someone do a grip reduction. You know, I just find the grip itself is very uncomfortable. An old man Glock, he doesn't care what I think. He hates me for not accepting his grip. If you treat your gun the way you take care of your lawnmower, buy a Glock. Because you can just about, there's one gun you don't have to clean and lube well, you can pretty much treat it pretty crappy in the gun's work. Um, be honest with you, it's a great gun. Even though I'm a hardcore 1911 guy, I love the 1911 pistol. And if I had to, somebody said, Ken, you can only own one handgun, only one. You know what? I'd probably say, give me a Glock 17. Glocks are great guns. They work when you need them to work. And, uh, and that's what counts when it comes down to brass tacks. Is this going to work? Uh, the world uh, uh, is littered with the, uh, with the bleaching bones of firearms companies that just didn't get there because they didn't have a product that actually worked well. Uh, the patent office is full of, of paper on firearms inventions and patents that just never got where they needed to go because they just weren't practical. Uh, with a Glock, it's different. It, it works, it's practical. Personally, I, I, uh, I would like to see some, some sex appeal thrown into the mix, and uh, then they'd have a classic. Back in 1981, Gaston Glock overheard two colonels in the Austrian army discussing that no one made the handgun they really needed. When Glock offered to make one, they laughed at him. No one is laughing now. For much of the world, Glock has become synonymous with pistol.